Hello, hello. I just wanted to uh, give a quick update on our recent Iceland uh, article that we just published. But uh, whoa, uh, yesterday the eruption recommenced. So um, this is going to be a little update on the eruption and on our article. And uh, yeah, I uh, was traveling and uh, so I was a bit delayed with uh, this article summary. And now events overtook my efforts. So uh, let me kind of uh, share my screen here. So this is uh, what's going on right now. We have uh, a new fissure that opened up yesterday lunchtime and it's pouring out lava. In yellow, we have the lava field from last year and the vents, the little triangles. And just to the north of it, the new fissure opened up producing an extension of the lava field towards the north, pouring lava into the little valley over there. So uh, this is how it looks like. So here we have the fissure, and um, this is the new lava coming out. And the darker area here, that's the uh, lava from last year. And uh, here we have now an extension of the lava field, as I said. Now, of course, you can go to various uh, webcams, and uh, there is uh, live reports. So you uh, can actually watch the eruption, which uh, I do most of the day here. It's running, um, you know, besides my day work and uh, there's various uh, uh, versions so you can actually pick and uh, here you see the fissure and the new lava and a lot of volatiles coming out so uh, this is very exciting and um, here's just yet another one with different perspectives so here you have little fire fountains coming out from that fissure the fissure is aligned with uh, the old lava field and I'll talk about that in a minute and if you want you can also go to uh, uh, Guten Talk, he's one of the vloggers in Iceland, and uh, that's him here. And uh, he was out there last night already up close to the lava. Quite exciting, actually. So, and I'm hoping to get a chance to go there next week. I've been in touch with colleagues in Iceland now, Thor, my friend, and uh, we're thinking about doing a little bit of field work in the next few days, then continuing our lava sampling. And here we see the uh, well, the lava rivers up close, Guten Talk has recorded it for us, and it's quite exciting. So have a look there. I think he deserves a like for that. So, and um, yeah, here you see some rafts of material that are transported, and of course, some of the vegetation burns off. And, uh, whoa, quite exciting to be uh, close up there. So this is what's going on, and by the looks of it, this eruption might continue like the one last year for a little bit of time. Now let's talk a little bit about the article um, that we published. And um, this is this article here. And we made a prediction last um, um, about the eruption from last year. And it seems that the new eruption that just recommenced is actually confirming our prediction. I'll talk about this in a minute. Now, this is a rather geochemical paper. So hopefully I'm not gonna lose you all there, but uh, I'm quickly gonna try to run us through this. And uh, this was led by Ilya Bindemann from Oregon University, Francis Deegan here in Uppsala, myself, Tor Tordesen, Arman Herskelson from Iceland University and Will Moorland also. And then a team from GFZ um, Potsdam, Edgar Sorn, um, Alina Shevchenko and Tom Walter have all contributed here. So here we looked at the uh, lava chemistry and uh, we have in particular looked at uh, the um, chemistry through time. And for that, we sampled the lava field. So let me quickly um, show some of the figures here. So this is the area that we sampled. All our sample locations are given here in numbers. And uh, we have uh, made sure we are recording the days um, when the different lava lobes and tongues formed dura, during the eruption, throughout the eruption. I should point out that here on the Reykjans Peninsula, we have this strange phenomenon. It's not just two plates kind of coming apart like it's often portrayed. It's actually more of a slipping situation. It's a transform fault, as we call it. And once we have this transport movement, it can open up a little and you create these openings these passive openings and then magma can leak through rather than bursting its way through. It's rather more of an opening that happens because of the tectonics and then magma oozes out in a rather calm fashion. This is why the eruption on Iceland uh, that we've seen last year and again this one here is rather benign. It's rather, um, yeah, uh, wonderful to watch and not so dangerous and the fire funds are not too high because it's an oozing out process. But 
Here, the important thing is that uh, we sampled the lavas throughout the eruptive record for several months. And uh, we looked at them, of course, under the microscope. So here we see different microscope images. And uh, the important thing is we sampled the chemistry, analyzed the, these samples for their chemistry. And what we see here is that the magnesium content from day zero to day 160 rises up and then it falls again towards the end. And various other parameters do that as well, potassium over titanium, here niobium over zirconium, we rise up and then we go down and then we wobble around a little bit. And uh, here we have for zirconium yttrium quite a spread of compositions to start with, and also for thorium and peribium, and then it seems to kind of become a little bit more focused. Now, the uh, interpretation of that is that uh, we must have had different batches of magma contributing with different parcels of magma, likely from different areas in the mantle. And we tested this. This is a bunch of diagrams that people have been using in the past to estimate the mantle components to characterize different components in the earth mantle. And uh, here we see enriched and depleted components and uh, well, we are really going across this enriched field. So here we have uh, ni uh, niobium yttrium and zirconium yttrium. And there we see OIB plume type material, enriched Icelandic morp is over here and N-morp mid-ocean rich basalt is down here. And yeah, you see it's spreading out. It's not just a single type of material, it's spreading out. And it seems to therefore characterize different components that have been contributing. This is in a very interesting plot here, this uh, niobium zirconium, zirconium uh, yttrium. And there we have end member compositions that people have characterized the algae on Snifel's nest, but also depleted plume component. And uh, here we see that uh, our array of data spreads quite a wide field. And uh, this led us to suggest that we have different uh, melts different magmas from different mantle domains that have contributed. How these domains look down there in the mantle, we don't know. Some people want them to be like plum pudding, some others want it to be like streaks, like a streaky bacon model has been proposed. Um, well, but I think uh, we must assume that there is heterogeneity in the mantle on a pretty small scale. And if we look at this, here is what peridotite derived melts might look like, and here's what pyroxenite derived melt would look like. These are two main uh, rock types that we expect to be in the mantle. Then we see that our samples spread quite across this, and there seems to be also a temporal progression. But the important thing that the article uh, reports is actually that uh, despite these complex variations in majors and traces, we have very little variation in oxygen isotopes. The delta 18 O, the delta uh, notation for our oxygen isotope ratio uh, seems to give us values that is really, really straight. It's really kind of the same almost throughout the eruption. And the implication is that the mantle components that have contributed, they might be different for various chemical parameters, but not so for oxygen isotopes. That's important because uh, there's this big debate how some of the very low, uh, comparatively low oxygen isotope compositions in central Iceland come about. Some people say it's crustal influence. Some people say it already comes from the mantle, bringing up deep recycled material from uh, the earth interior that has been formerly subducted. Now, that is the debate is open, but the mantle components that have contributed to last year's eruption don't seem to have sampled any of those deep mantle components with low delta 80 no. That's not to say they don't exist or not to say they don't exist under the Reykjans Peninsula, but they seemingly have not contributed to last year's eruption. Now, if this is meaningful for Iceland as a whole, then uh, the implication would be that a lot of the low delta 18 O compositions in central Iceland might actually be due to influence from the crust, due to assimilation from the crust. So, and uh, here we have a plot with the Holaraun uh, eruptives from a few years ago, and they have uh, much, much lower delta 18 O values than uh, the uh, eruptions from last year from the Reykjans. And here's Atlantic Morp, and uh, it almost coincides with Atlantic Morp, what has erupted last year. So, this is very intriguing, and uh, it hints at uh, some of the 
uh, low delta adenal values in central Iceland being due to crustal influence. Now, how does this look like? Well, um, in our kind of conceptual model here at the end, we seem to, uh, we suggest that there is a plume material rising up from depth and uh, this uh, might then uh, bring material and it might interact with low delta adenal crust on the way to the surface, certainly in central Iceland. Uh, it could well be some deep contributions of this low delta adenal material, or as we also hint here, there could be bits of the crust breaking off, falling into the mantle, and then they come back up with the plume. So it is possible that uh, the plume brings up some low delta adenal material that has been formerly actually in the crust. So Iceland is famous for this low oxygen isotope crust, and uh, it's a really intriguing kind of phenomenon. And out here on the Reykjans Peninsula, this is east-west, um, there we don't seem to have any material like this, uh, low delta adeno material being sampled last year. So this is our little model here in the mantle. We have these different domains and we illustrated them as streaks. Uh, in, in alignment with a streaky bacon model. And uh, here we have these OIB, these uh, plume type materials. We have enriched morph coming with the plume, but we also have depleted material. And um, we have ambient mantle material. And uh, we must have had the contributions from different nuggets or streaks or whatever there in the mantle contributing towards this eruption last year. But it seems none of them had particularly low delta in O. So this is intriguing. Now, this was the uh, main conclusion from the method. And uh, one very important aspect that I should also highlight is, and this is in the appendix. I'll put the link to the paper down there in the text box and you can download it for free. It's open access. And uh, in the supplement material, which you can also download for free, um, there we have this discussion. We didn't quite think it was that important, but it now turns out that we may have misjudged this. We may have been the more important aspect of the paper. And that is the geological record of the Reykjans Peninsula actually um, gives us a major eruption episode about 800 years ago. And it lasted for several hundred years from about uh, 800 to 1200 um, <clears throat> of our time. And um, it was showing activity along several of the eruptive centers in the area. So this was uh, preceded by a larger gap, by a larger eruption break, a hiatus. And uh, after looking a little bit deeper, we found that there is yet more of an eruption episode. We call it period two. And uh, this also affected most of the vents in the area. And yet older, another gap, another hiatus, another pause in eruption. And uh, then here at about uh, 1000 uh, BC, we had another eruption episode. So we cannot help but get this sense that eruption episodes on the Reykjans Peninsula are cyclic. There is a major pulse and it lasts for several hundred years. And then there is a gap of uh, several hundred years up to a thousand years potentially. And then another pulse kicks in and then uh, again followed by a pause. So since there was a big pause prior to the eruption last year, the speculation we offered was that the last year's eruption could just be the beginning of a new major eruption episode. We didn't quite anticipate that uh, this would, you know, manifest itself uh, so quickly in another eruption. But uh, well, at least from our initial observations now, it seems our speculation might be true. We will have to see, of course, over the next tens of years and um, hundreds of years. I will not see the end of it if the speculation is or our our proposal is actually true in in its full scale. But this may well be something to watch out for. So maybe a major eruption episode for quite some time has commenced on the Reykjans Peninsula. So new eruption has started yesterday. I'm uh, in a way excited. Uh, on the other side, I'm also a little overwhelmed because now we have to continue sampling. We have to continue the work and see whether this new pulse of eruption brings up new material, brings up different materials. Let's see whether there is any low delta adenal material amongst the eruption products this time, or whether it still samples these were all the regular upper mantle domains uh, with a regular 
uh, MORC type oxygen isotope signal. Very big questions here and a uh, great opportunity for us to study these processes, but a lot of work ahead. So thank you very much. All the very best and um, I'll catch up with you very, very soon. Bye-bye.